So, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to the virtual seminar series on uh, Gaussian processes, spatiotemporal modeling, and decision-making systems. And I'm so excited to have everybody here. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and my name is Alex Turenin. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of uh, Cambridge, and one of the organizers will be hosting today's event. And I'd like to thank my fellow organizers, Jeff Pleiss, uh, Lisa Simonova, and uh, Zhe Wang for putting this series together. Uh, thanks very much for this. And I just want to make a few uh, brief organizational announcements before we begin. Uh, so the first of these is that you can find the schedule on our website, which is gp-seminar-series.github.io. And uh, on there is a schedule for upcoming seminars. So check it out. Uh, you can join via Zoom, provided you uh, register and receive uh, Zoom links via email. Or you can join via YouTube, which uh, does not require any registration. Seminars typically take place at a 1600 UTC. And uh, be aware that the conversion from UTC into your local time zone may change due to daylight savings. So just be on the lookout for this. If you're joining via Zoom, you can use the raise your hand option on Zoom to ask questions or simply type them in the chat. And the speaker can choose to pause and answer questions during the talk or hold questions on the end, depending on their preferences. And with all of these things said, it is my great pleasure to introduce James Hensman, who is a principal applied scientist at Amazon, who will give today's uh, keynote seminar on spherical Gaussian processes. James, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Alex. And uh, thanks everybody for coming and thanks for having me. Um, really, really excited to talk to you today about uh, some work that I've been doing with some of my co-authors on, on spherical DPs. Excuse me a second whilst I deal with some technical screen sharing. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about spherical Gaussian processes. Uh, Hopefully you're all seeing a beautiful moving blob of Gaussian processes on my on your video screen right now. What I'm showing you is a sequence of functions drawn from a Gaussian process prior, which is defined on a sphere. By this, I mean the input space of my Gaussian process or the index set is a sphere. And so each draw from the DP represents a mapping from point on the sphere to, uh, to a real number. And in the usual way for GPs, those real numbers are all jointly Gaussian distributed in the Kolmogorov way that we all know and love. What I'm showing you in the video is a sort of tour through the space of functions uh, you know, from one of these spherical Gaussian processes. So yellow represents high values, blue represents low values, and I'm extending the sphere in the, in the positive direction to, to emphasize the shape of the functions that you can get from, from some of these spherical DPs. Why should we care about spherical DPs in the first place? Well, these are the Gaussian processes that arise as the limit of very large neural network behavior. So you might be aware that very large deep neural networks become Gaussian processes with appropriate assumptions on the, on the weight space. And so if we want to replicate the kind of very powerful deep learning models that we see with a neural network, then it's probably a good idea to start studying these, these spherical DPs. And these spherical DPs are super convenient from a computational perspective. So some of the talk I'll show you today is uh, it's really about how do we how do we make efficient computations with this type of Gaussian process. Before I dive in, I want to say a big thanks to uh, Nicolas Durand and Vincent Dutadois. Maybe they're in the chat. Uh, the, these folks have been my co-authors in all of this work. I'm not going to show you a particular paper, but I will show you some of our, our joint work at the, at the end of the talk. So thanks, folks. You uh, it's been a great uh, great pleasure working with you on this. Okay, so how's my talk gonna look? I'm going to show you four things. I'm going to show you that one, neural networks are actually spherical functions. 
Two, I'm going to show you that neural networks in the large limit are Gaussian processes. Three, I'm going to show you spherical harmonics, which is a method for decomposing these spherical Gaussian processes. And that leads to number four, variational Gaussian processes and how variational Gaussian processes fit in beautifully with this sort of spherical harmonic decomposition of these spherical Gaussian processes. So those are my four sections. Some of this content may be familiar to some of you already, but if not, then uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. And if you're familiar, well, then I hope, uh, hope I can show you something new at least. I'll pause for questions after each section. So uh, there'll, be a, there'll be an obvious break slide and if you want to raise your hand, I'm sure Alex can help me um, curate, some, curate some good questions. Okay, so first section. How do we get from neural networks to spheres? Where do these spheres come from? They come from the ReLU is the short answer. So here's a little uh, animation of what happens in a neural network. So on the left side of your screen, what you're looking at is a neural network with two inputs and one output and two hidden layers. And those hidden layers have five and seven units respectively. And I'm showing you the weights of those neural networks uh, in the, the colors of the connections between the nodes. So yellow represents a strong connection plus one and uh, purple represents a, a negative connection minus one, green is kind of zero standard Bovidis color scheme. And for any setting of the weights, the neural network defines a function from inputs to outputs, and I'm showing you that function on the right-hand panel of the screen. So here we have x1 and x2. So x1 is the input that goes into this new one of the neural network, and x2 is the input that goes into this neuron of the neural network. And for any one weight setting, that neural network defines a function. And as we go through the uh, frames of my GIF, what I'm doing is I'm taking you on a tour through the weight space. So I've defined a standard normal zero one prior on the weights, and I've picked a sequence of equi probable weights on, on sort of around that prior, and I'm moving in a big ring around the, the prior on the weight space. Uh, so that's why the image kind of moves around in front of you. And the right hand side shows you for every second of the weights, there is one corresponding function represented by that neural network. Not really any spheres here yet. Uh, to work out where the spheres come from, I'm going to pair everything back a lot. So the spheres come from here. Here's a simple neural network, and it has two inputs one output, one hidden layer with a single neuron in it, and our favorite, the value activation function. And the same color scheme on the left and on the right. And what we can see now is that this type of function you can represent with this neural network is really, really simple. It's pretty much just a value function. So if I pause the video for a second, you can see that uh, in this region of the input space, the output is always zero. So the neural, the, the, the ReLU is sort of not firing, if you like. And in this region of the input space in the bottom right-hand corner, the, uh, the neural network represents a linear kind of function. And as we spin through the weight space of this uh, very, very simplified neural network, we see that the function that we're getting is kind of spinning around by the origin. So we have sort of flat and then upward slope, but the angle of that upward slope changes as we change the weights. And whether the upward slope is pointing up or pointing down, that changes as a function of the weights as well. I guess I'm just gonna preempt a question here about, uh, about some of the visualizations. So uh, the, the contour lines here are showing relative values of the function. The two colors on the left-hand side of the screen and the right-hand side of the screen don't match up. Purple is down, yellow is up but they're relative on each side of the screen. And occasionally you see the right-hand side does something a little bit weird. You see this sort of jaggedy lines on the, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the contour plot. That's just a plotting artifact. The neural network isn't really wiggly. It's just flat and then straight up with a, with a ready. Okay, still not quite a sphere. Let's just go one step further. So what I've done here is I've added a bias back in. So now I've got 
one neuron with a hidden unit and uh, that hidden unit's got a bias and I'm gonna spin in the joint bias and weight space here. So I'm taking you on a tour through the weight, joint weight and bias space. And you can see that I get the same kind of spinning of my, of my function, but the center of the, of the point that I'm spinning around is now moving because of the bias. Why has this happened? This spherical function here is what we're kind of really looking at with this very simplified neural network. So what I'm showing you here is uh, a three-dimensional function and the horizontal axis and the backwards axis, so the X and the Y axis, represent the two inputs to the neural network. And the vertical axis represents a bias input. So maybe you're familiar with this uh, very standard thing that you might do with linear models or neural networks where you append a column of ones onto your data. And so it's an extra input onto the, onto the function. That's what's happening here. And you see that this, uh, this function, which is flat and then linear, uh, is represented by these contours that are kind of floating above the, the sphere here. And that's because the bias input is always, always a one, it's just fixed to be a one. And then on the sphere that I've drawn underneath the, uh, that I'm sort of representing underneath the contours here, you see a Rayleigh function projected onto the sphere. And so to get the neural network, what we can do is we can define our function on the sphere, and then we can project it back onto the plane above the sphere. And if we do that, then we can just work with this function on the sphere, and that's all we ever need to do. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the mathematics of this spherical function in a second, but if we have any number of neural networks with, a, with, a, with, with large numbers of neurons, then all we're really doing is taking linear combinations of these, of these spherical functions. So if I was to add more neurons in this hidden layer, then I would be able to find multiple of these functions and I would just combine them to get my, to get my neural network function. And so I could combine them in the sphere and then project them. So I could just do all of my work on the sphere. Here's how that spherical function comes out of a value. So if A is my value function, my rectified linear unit, and what I'm doing is value of X times W. So X can have a one on it and W can have the bias appended as the last element, if you like. Then by simple, uh, simple rule of, can of cancellation in the top line, if RX and RW are the length of the vector X and the length of the vector W, then we can write this top top line here. And then because the value function is homogeneous, we can actually pull that constant out of the value function. So value of constant times X is equal to constant times value of X. Very straightforward uh, homogeneity property of values. And then what we're left with inside the value argument is the inner product between two points that are now on the sphere. So dividing X by its radius or the length of X and dividing W by its radius or length of W projects those two points back onto the sphere. And then the inner product of those two things is just the angle. So going back to my slide over here, the center of that yellow mass on the sphere is defined by W. So W tells you what is the angle that you need to make with the inputs. And then when we project back up into that, uh, the plane that's above the sphere, well, that's just multiplying by the radius outside the brain. So A of cosine of theta is just this lovely spherical function that we can see over here. All right, that's a good moment to pause for questions. Uh, values give you spherical functions. Any questions or comments? And I just want to note for the audience that uh, you can ask questions by using Zoom's raise hand option. I believe we have one um, or also by typing in the chat. Um, James, uh, you should have uh, co-host privileges and be able to click on people to unmute them if you'd like, if you'd like them to ask the question. Great. I don't know, you have a question. Thank you. This is, this is a wonderful simulation. I mean, uh, it's a good visualization. I was wondering, there is just one angle, right? Because you have the W and the X. So in some sense, you have this rotational symmetry around the W vector. That's right. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, so in more higher dimensions, you would still have this just one angle, but 
you, you know, you, I, I just the visualization breaks down for me when I think beyond 3D. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I'm showing you uh, two spheres, so spheres with a two-dimensional surface. Um, but of course, if I have more than two inputs, then I will have hyperspheres, and we still just need to look at the angle along the hypersphere. Yeah, great call. Cool. Okay, thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, then I will. I think there are the also two more questions in the chat. Sorry, oh, James, I don't know if you I, have this. Oh, thanks, Alex. I just can't see the chat. Maybe you could uh, hit me with the questions. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to unmute the folks uh, asking to allow them to speak. Um, uh, hi, uh, I had a question about the weights. So I didn't understand quite how the weights were sampled when you were making those plots, uh, um, where the ReLU was like going around in a circle. So that's a, that's a good question. So let, let me just rewind for a quick sec. And uh, oh, here we go. So what's happening here is we have, a, we have two weights on the input. So there's this purple weight and this green weight. And the angle that this value is going up at depends on the angle between that two-dimensional weight vector and the two-dimensional input vector. Right. So that's why that's why the angle the angle is sort of pointing down to the bottom right over here is because of the angle between the vector defined by these two weights and the vector of the two inputs. Does that help? Okay, maybe. Uh, Maybe I shall move on into the next section. And uh, if there are more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to get to them at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. All right, part two, really baking your network to TPs. So this is a fairly well-known result these days and there's an awful lot of very exciting work in this area. And what I'm gonna to try to show you in this section is some intuition for how, how this limit kind of occurs. So, Here's my very simplified spherical neural network back again. And what I'm showing you now is if I was to put a, a normal zero one prior on all of these three weights and then sample from them and then look at the distribution of the output at one particular location. So here it's the output at this, uh, this location underneath the histogram. Then this blue histogram here shows you what output values you would have. And you see there's a big spike in the middle. And the reason there's a big spike in the middle is because the neural network spends an awful lot of its time outputting zero for that particular location. In fact, it has to spend a lot of its time outputting zero for any particular location. No matter what output location I chose to show you the histogram of, we would see that uh, the output function would spend half of its time being zero at that location. And I'm showing you the, uh, the output value of the function corresponds to this black line. So as I spin through the weight space, as I take this tour around the weight space, a lot of the time this particular output location has value zero and then it sort of moves to the left and comes back to zero for a while. And if I was to take you on another tour, it would move to the right. And on average, what you would see is this little histogram here. And what's happening here is, uh, this is very much not a Gaussian process. So this distribution is, uh, it's very spiky, it's got this big uh, big value in the middle and this little tail over here, very much from the Gaussian. And as we add more width to the neural network, we get something that becomes a little bit more Gaussian. So here we have the same situation, I'm taking you on a tour through the weight space of a, uh, a neural network with five hidden units. And we have this kind of Laplace looking uh, distribution over here for the distribution of the output. And as you might expect, the space of functions that we're able to represent is getting more complex as we add more, more and more hidden units. And if we use a huge number of hidden units, so here I'm using 30 whole hidden units, uh, and then you can see that the distribution of the output as we change the, 
if we sample from the weight space prior, becomes more and more Gaussian. So we get this lovely looking Gaussian bump for uh, the value of the function that we see at this one particular location of the output. And as you take the, the width of the, the neural network, as you increase the number of uh, units in the hidden layer to infinity, you, uh, you sure enough do get a Gaussian process behavior. So in other words, the output, the function value at any location will be exactly Gaussian distributed. And the, the sort of uh, co-distribution between any pair or any set of points on the output will be Gaussian distributed. And so you, uh, you have a, a well-defined Gaussian process. If you know a little bit about Gaussian processes, you'll know that you need to define them through a mean and covariance function. So the natural question is, well, what is the mean and covariance function of your deep neural network Gaussian process? Well, the mean is zero, assuming you have a, a zero mean weight space prior. Um, and under some mild conditions, the kernel or covariance function uh, converges to this. This is for a single hidden layer. So we see that we've got a function that mimics that value behavior that we saw earlier. So we have the covariance between x and y is rx, ry, so the length of the vector x and the length of the vector y times kappa, which is some function defined on x bar, y bar. x bar, y bar are just the, the x and y divided by rx and divided by ry, so they're, they're just mapped back to the sphere. So x transpose, x bar transpose y bar is the angle between x and y or the cosine of the angle between x and y. And the kappa functions defined on the screen here, other kappa functions are available, but this is the one that arises as the limit of a single, uh, single depth value activated neural network. And the way I think about this kernel is as a kernel on the polar coordinates of the input. So I think about changing x and y to uh, like x breaking back to the sphere and length of x. And then I have a linear kernel on the radius. So Rx times Ry, it's like having a, a linear kernel on that part. And then I've got some kernel, which is, I'm gonna say spherically stationary, defined on the angular part of the, of the input. So you might be asking, well, okay, but those are not very realistic neural networks because everybody knows you need depth, right? So what happens if you add more depth to the neural network? Do you still get a Gaussian process? Yes, you do. Uh, thank you to multiple of my, my colleagues in the field who have proved this very rigorously, especially uh, Alex Matthews, who did some lovely work on this a few years ago. Here I'm showing you a two layer neural network with 30 hidden units in each layer, uh, taking you on by a familiar tour of the weight space. And I'm showing you the distribution of the output and you can see it's kind of Gaussian-ish, so we need to be a little bit careful about taking the infinite limit to get a Gaussian here, but it does indeed convert to a Gaussian process in the limit. And what you might notice is that the space of functions that we're able to represent is much more wiggling. So we're able to see much more sort of richer functions using our two depth, uh, two layer neural network than we were with, uh, with the one layer neural network. And the Gaussian process that arises as the infinitely wide limit of this two-layer neural network is similarly richer in its, uh, in its structure as we're going to see. What is the kernel when we add another layer? Well, it's really cool that all you need to do is do kappa of kappa. So if you define the first, the one layer as Rx, Ry, kappa of Xy, then uh, to get depth two, you need to do kappa of kappa, and it follows that to do depth D, you need to do kappa of kappa of kappa, D times. So this is pretty straightforward implementing your favorite programming language. Uh, you just need to recurse this little kappa function, D times. Uh, I have a nice conjecture for you here, which is that uh, this function kappa applied to the kernel always gives you a valid kernel. So I found this quite surprising when I first found it. I'm pretty used to making new kernels by adding kernels together, multiplying kernels together, raising kernels to powers, transforming the inputs to kernels, but applying a function to a kernel feels like a weird thing to do, right? That doesn't feel like it should always result in a kernel. Well, kappa has some special properties, which is that the 
coefficients of the Taylor expansion are always, uh, uh, always non-negative. So if I was to rewrite kappa as this Taylor expansion, so here I'm writing kappa of some input u as uh, u to power n, where n is, the, is an integer, and alpha n are the, uh, the, the Taylor coefficients of this expansion, while raising a kernel to an integer power, but well, that's always a valid kernel. Adding kernels together is always a valid kernel. And so, so long as my kernel is within the radius of convergence of my Taylor expansion, then applying kappa to that kernel will always give you a, a, a new kernel. So uh, you're welcome, everybody. You now have a new tool for making new kernels that you didn't have before, or at least I didn't have before. Okay, so what does this all boil down to? Well, now instead of defining my uh, neural network weight prior, I can just use the Gaussian process prior. So here's what it looks like. I stick an extra column of ones on my input. I define my, uh, my kernel with depth. Depth is now a hyperparameter of my kernel. And I can now sample from this kernel and then project that back up onto the plane and that defines uh, uh, sort of prior over functions that I can use in the usual Gaussian processes are good for machine learning way. So what you're looking at here is again, the sequence of samples from a uh, spherical Gaussian process defined using the equations I showed you in the previous slide and then projected back up into a two-dimensional surface with a constant input of one. And that defines um, uh, this, these sort of contours that I'm showing you above the sphere that becomes our prior on functions to use in your machine learning applications. Uh, I will pause here for more questions. Please raise your hand and I'll uh, unmute you if I can. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, we also have a oh, we also have a raised hand now. Um, sorry, James, I'll let you on. Thanks, Z. You have a question? Uh, yes. Hi, James. So Hi. I was wondering uh, if we have uh, those typical stationary kernels like squared exponential or maturing kernels, but we just define those norms used in these kernels as um, the ones defined on angles. Um, do we have like similar, uh, these similar um, spherical, uh, spherical properties? Um, and if that's the case, what's the additional benefit of these spherical kernels? Yeah, what a cool question. Thanks so much. So um, in a standard stationary kernel, we are stationary with respect to distance. So the kernel is only a function of x minus y. Um, so k of x, y is equal to some function of x minus y or apps x minus y. And that gives rise to Bochner's theorem, which says I can use the spectrum of the kernel to define everything that I need to know about this kernel. And analogously, as we will see in the coming sections, there is a Bochner's theorem for, the, for these uh, spherically stationary kernels as well, and they are defined as a function of just the angle between x and y. So there's a, there's a radial part, which is linear, and an angular part, and we're just looking at the angle between x and y. And it's the angle that's mostly mostly interesting here, and the angle that has this spherically stationary property. So what is the advantage? Well, uh, one of the advantages is here's a whole new space of kernels to go and play with. Um, Another one of the advantages is uh, I'm going to show you how you can compute very efficiently with these with these kernels in a, in a second. Thanks for your question. Thanks. Yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, maybe just a, a very brief follow up. Um, I guess what I meant is something instead of k of x and y um, for stationary kernels, we have k of say uh, phi of x and y which computes the angle and use that angle to compute the um, norm somehow. Got it. Okay. So uh, let me, hold on just a second. 
So uh, I'm going to have to think for a second about whether you can just apply your favorite RBF kernel to the angle. My, my immediate reaction is no. Um, so the angle kind of runs from zero to pi. And so we need some kernel which is going to be uh, I, I suppose you could just plug it in. I would have to think about whether that was positive definite or ask one of my smarter friends whether you could just apply an RBF to the angle and see and whether that would be positive definite. I'm sure that if uh, Nicola Durand or Arnold Solon, Arnold Solon are on the call, they can they can give you the definitive answer to that. Uh, but I would say that this kappa function applied to the angle or the cosine of the angle always gives you a positive definite. Um, function. And there is, we will see in a second that there is a whole way of finding kernels through their spectrum uh, that will always lead us to positive definite kernels. So uh, I, think, I think you should think about this as a whole sort of new space of kernels that we've not encountered before that encounter some of these properties of neural networks. They, I think there's a lot of work still to do to work out like, these kernels work great. Should we use them for all of our problems? Do they, they inherit some of the properties of neural networks? I think that's still very much a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think Alex also pointed out some um, interesting facts in the chat. Thanks. Okay, let me uh, move on to the next section, if that's okay with you. So uh, the third thing I want to tell you was about spherical harmonics. So hopefully this is a fairly quick section. Spherical harmonics are a way to get the Mercer decomposition of any of these kernels. So if I write my kernel as Rx, Ry, kappa of Xy, as all of these kernels have been, then I can rewrite it as this infinitely large sum. And you can think about this as a Bochner approximation to the, to the kernel. So if you're familiar with sparse spectrum GPs or Fourier or um, uh, or uh, any of these kind of approaches to, to GPs, this is sort of the equivalent of the spherically stationary rather than spatially stationary uh, kernels. So the Rx, Ry part, the linear part in the radius, that just remains. And then we're going to sum over n, which is going to index frequency. So n goes from zero to infinity with zero being constant, one being linear, two being uh, quadratic and, and so on. Lambda n, and lambda is a function of the kernel, so I'll talk more about lambda in just a second. And then we're going to sum over L, which indexes an angle or a rotation. And the, uh, the basis functions phi are then indexed by their frequency and by their rotation. And then once I have this uh, Mercer decomposition, I can this, this sort of is the Hilbert space mapping of the kernel, if you like, and then I can do some cool computational things that I'll show you in a second. So every kernel function in this Hilbert space can be made up from a linear combination of these functions phi and L. Uh, there are some regularity conditions on kappa to make sure this thing holds. They, they definitely hold for all of the kernels that I've shown you so far in the, uh, in the talk. And these functions phi are special because they're orthogonal with respect to the uniform measure on the sphere. That means that if you were to multiply phi and L by phi n prime L prime, and then integrate with respect to with respect to their argument over the over the spherical input, then you would get a it's zero if n and n prime and L and L prime were not equal. And what's cool about that is it's going to lead us to diagonal matrices. So Gaussian processes are always associated with big kernel matrices that you have to do a big Cholesky decomposition on, and while that's already a pain, so uh, the sort of orthogonality property that comes from this decomposition is going to lead us to uh, sort of the, the promised land, if you like, of uh, diagonal matrices to compute with. Let me show you a little bit more about these functions. So here is a picture of some of these spherical harmonics. So these phi functions are spherical harmonics, and in this picture here, which I've taken from a paper with, uh, with my co-authors, Vincent and, and Nicola, uh, the rows are indexing the frequency and the columns are indexing the angle or orientation. 
And so the top picture is just a constant function. The next one is just a linear function, but they're in three dimensions, you need three linear functions, one in X, one in Y, and one in Z. And then we have some quadratic functions and we need more of those. And then there are some cubic functions and even more of those. And as we go up through, go up through the frequency, we need more and more of these, um, more and more of these orientations to sort of fill the space of functions that we need to form a basis on the sphere. So this is what the functions look like. And this is how they're related to the cone. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is the shape of kappa for various depths. So on the left-hand plot, kappa is on the vertical axis. So this is the, the shape of the function. And theta, so that's the angle between x and y is on the, on the horizontal axis. And for depth one, we just have this, this shape that looks kind of like a kernel. And as we recurse kappa, kappa, kappa of, of the inputs, we end up with this, uh, with this function, which sort of, uh, sort of becomes a little bit degenerate as we go to very, very high depths. And what I'm showing on the right-hand side is the eigenvalues that are associated with, the, with those different counts. Uh, so to work out how to compute the eigenvalues, check out some of our papers, have a look through the, uh, through the appendix. The computing the eigenvalues is simply a function of simply a case of integrating the kernel function against an appropriate polynomial. But what you can see here is that for a small amount of depth, the eigenvalues decay very quickly. So that means that the kernel is made up of lots of low frequency functions. And as you add more depth, the eigenvalues are decaying more slowly. So lambda, vertical axis of the eigenvalues here, I'm showing you on the log scale. So the blue plot is showing you how fast the eigenvalues decay for a depth one, and the green plot is showing you for depth 50. And as you move to the right, as you go up in N, you're having more and more high frequency content. So N, remember from the previous slide, is these increasingly complicated functions or increasing order of the polynomial. And so we can make more and more complex functions uh, to appear more regularly within the prior as we increase the depth of the kernel. There's some other interesting things happening here. So the depth one, there are some holes in the spectrum um, that caused us quite a lot of uh, problems for a few weeks when we were trying to work out why that was occurring. Um, but that goes away as soon as you go to depth two and, and beyond. Uh, and what else should I say about this? Um, yeah, so depth depth has sort of become the way of controlling the complexity of the of the prior on on the functions here. So, the summary is, I guess, deeper kernels, uh, small slowly decaying eigenvalues, and thus a more complicated function space to deal with. Uh, any questions about this federal harmonics? Z, do you have another question? Oh, hey, um, I don't think I have a, a question. I, I just made a comment, uh, but it's probably not um, about this particular part. And I saw uh, David also have a question. David Blanco. Uh, David, can you use the raise hand feature? Oh, there we go. Yeah, hi. So the question that I have is, um, if if you know if there are any benefits of spherical uh, spherical GPS uh, compared to GPS on Riemannian manifolds? Uh, well, so at, uh, I mean, at least from from what you just said, I I saw that the com this composition that it would be quite different because I think that you cannot do that if you if you work with GPS on the remand manifold, but I don't know if, if, if there's anything else aside from that. So I guess uh, the sphere is a manifold, is uh, it's my first answer, and it's a nice simple manifold. And so th this this setup holds, uh, Alex is the expert here. So if you really want to know about deep on, on remanding manifolds, then uh, we should definitely wait for Alex's talk. But the cool thing about GPs on spherical manifolds is that these basis functions are closed form. I don't have to have any kind of numerical solution. It's just a little polynomial function. So you can just do, you know, import, uh, 
impulse file for harmonics, file for harmonics dot phi ml, and that will give you a function, uh, a basis function, just like a sinusoid or, or anything else. So that's uh, that kind of leads to this very efficient way to, to compute with them. So that's the that's the advantage of using a sphere, and the sphere sort of arises very naturally, right? So yes, you can do TPs on Riemannian manifolds if your input space is some some manifold, which could include a sphere. Um, then uh, there's some lovely ways to define uh, define TPs like that. But I'm sort of saying, well, these neural networks very naturally give rise to these spherical functions, right? And these spherical kernels. Maybe we should use them more. All right, I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Thanks for your question, David. Uh, this, so this last section is about how we can use these spherically harmonically decomposed spherical Gaussian processes in combination with variational Gaussian process inference. So here's a quick picture of how you can fit a GPE using variational base. So usually we think of GPEs as a thing where you do uh, matrix inversion or Cholesky decomposition of your covariance matrix. But a lot of work has been done by lots of good people to say, well, actually, we could just do variational inference in the GP, right? And then all we would have to do is solve an optimization problem to move our approximate posterior Gaussian process close to the real posterior Gaussian process. And that has nice computational benefits. We can leverage mini batches and, and so on. So instead of GPs being a one-shot thing where we say, okay, I'm going to define my kernel matrix and I'm going to Cholesky decomposition it. Instead, I'm going to define an optimization problem and then I'm going to randomly initialize an approximate solution to my Gaussian process and then I'm going to optimize the elbow until this, uh, this approximation converges to as close as it can to the posterior Gaussian process that I'm interested in. So here's the setup for a standard variational sparse Gaussian process. The elbow or the evidence low bound looks exactly like it does for any other uh, variational objective function in machine learning. We have an expected likelihood term, so the expected value of Q under Q of the log likelihood minus the KL divergence back to the prime. So if you're familiar with VAEs or anything else, you have a very similar setup. And my prime on functions here is going to be my standard normal 0k Gaussian process 0k uh, distribution, distribution for, for f. And my likelihood could be anything. It could be additive Gaussian noise or classification likelihood or Cox process or anything else that you're interested in. And I define my Q distribution, so my variational distribution that's going to approximate the posterior on GPs as being a new GP with mean m and variance mu. And it's parameterized like this. And then I'm going to optimize those parameters, uh, optimize the elbow with respect to those parameters until Q is a really good approximation for my, for my posterior Gaussian process. And the parameters I've got to optimize here are this vector mu that you see on the screen, this matrix, positive definite matrix S that you see on the screen, and these so called inducing points Z. So the classic way to do variation inference, most of the harmonics here, but the classic way to do this is to pick a set of pseudo inputs or inducing points Z to input into the GP, and I'm going to optimize over them along with S and mu at the same time. How did the spherical harmonics help? Well, instead of using these inducing points where we say, the inducing point value um is going to be f of zm, and z is a thing I'm going to optimize over. Instead of doing that, I'm going to choose um as the inner product between f and phi m. So I'm going to pick some indices. So some of these functions, remember, they're indexed by uh, frequency and by phase. So I'm going to pick some of those frequencies and phases and index them with m. And I'm going to define my random variable u as the inner product between f and phi. In, in that Hilbert space. And that leads to the result that instead of the covariance between my, my inducing variable and my function value being the kernel, now it is just phi. And so phi becomes the basis that I use to do my 
my variational inference with, and the kernel matrix that I have to invert in a sparse gouging process, instead of being a number of inducing points by number of inducing points dense matrix, is now a number of inducing points by a number of inducing points diagonal matrix. And it's full of the eigenvalues associated with the kernel that we saw earlier. So that means I can take the expressions that we, we were using for the sparse TP and substitute in these values. So this value for the mean function, instead of being a linear combination of kernel functions, reweighted by, uh, by k inverse times mu, now I have a linear combination of phi functions, reweighted by, uh, by, uh, by lambda inverse times mu. And similarly, the, the posterior approximate covariance uh, has these diagonal computations in it as well. And so we can save a lot of the computations in our, in our sparse GP. And we published this idea a few years ago in AI stats. Uh, and we showed that you know, these, these spherical TPs could get very, very close to neural network benchmarks. Uh, so we, we had a look at the supersymmetric particle accelerator benchmark and a bunch of other experiments in there. And we were able to show that you know, we could build models that computed very, very quickly and got very, very close to neural network performance and very, very close to uh, additive Gaussian process or variational Fourier feature Gaussian process benchmarks as well. And the other thing that we showed in here is that the approximation is optimal in the sense that we can always include the most important basis functions by truncating. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand side of the plot here is how much variance is associated with each of the functions that I'm including in my, uh, in my approximation. And so this is indexed by frequency and by, by phase again here. And the size of the square shows you the eigenvalue or the amount of the amount of variance uh, in from the from the function space that's associated with that, with that, uh, with that inducing variable or that inducing function. And so, by cutting off the uh, the frequencies at some point, we include a priori the optimal set of inducing points or inducing functions to approximate that posterior with. So, the summary of the paper is: Yeah, you can project your spherical Gaussian process onto these spherical harmonic functions. That gives you a lovely diagonalization you can expose in the elbow. That gives you models that are nice and powerful, but with all of the, the benefits of Gaussian processes that anybody in a seminar on Gaussian processes already, already knows and loves. We have another paper as a follow-up, which was in Europe last year, that said, you know what, instead of projecting onto the spherical harmonics, we could use the spherical harmonic to then project back onto the value functions themselves. So what this means is that now your, uh, your reducing variables or your, your basis functions become very close to value functions. They're polynomial approximations of value functions. And that means that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the computations that you have to do in your, in your elbow and a very standard neural network. And it's the same for deep Gaussian processes as well. If you have currents of Gaussian processes, then the currents turns up in the elbow, and the elbow's computations map perfectly onto a neural network. And that allows you to train uh, a Gaussian process using some of the machinery from a neural network and flip flop between, between the, two, uh, the two representations. And the cool thing about that is that now you can train these deep TPs in a way that's sort of powerful like, uh, like deep learning, but with sort of more robustness to, uh, to changes on the input. So here are some experiments we did on some various data sets where we corrupted the input. So we started with the MNIST data set and we, uh, we trained a neural network, neural network would drop out, neural network with uh, temperature scaling. And we, we used our, our projected Gaussian process method using the, the map, using the map that I've shown you. And as we rotated the MNIST digits, you can see that all of the methods have the same kind of accuracy, but the, uh, the GP and the temperature scaling neural network perform much better in terms of test load likelihood. So they become more robust to uh, these changes on the input. And the same kind of story happens for fashion MNIST and, and CPAL as well. So this framework lets you bring your Gaussian process computations much, much closer to the kind of things you can do do with deep learning. 
There is a lot of literature on this work around at the moment. There's some amazing papers being written. These are some of uh, some of my favorite papers in this area. If you'd like to go and read them, then uh, I'll make these slides available so that people can, people can check them out. But some of the most important works on spherical, uh, spherical, spherical kernels are also now showing that this is, that this is true for convolutional kernels. Uh, so uh, Zaid Hohai, and the student of a lovely paper, I recommend going reading that. Greg Yang has some really super work on uh, almost any neural network architecture becomes a Gaussian process in the limit and how you might compute that kernel. Some of the classic work by Radford Neal uh, back in the 1990s, you should definitely check out his thesis, showed how the, these neural networks became GPs. Uh, Alex Matthews extended that, that's a lovely paper as well. Some of these kernels that I've just shown you with these kappa functions are derived by, by Cho and Sol. Uh, neural tangent kernels are very strongly related. So uh, neural tangent kernels are also spherical. And I, if you want to check out a bunch more uh, super references on this work, check out the neural tangent package. There's a lovely list of papers for you to go and read. That is all I have for you today, but I'm really happy to take any questions you've got. Hey, thanks, James, for the talk. Um, I just want to offer the option for people to ask questions uh, while the talk is still being live streamed on YouTube. Um, but uh, if uh, somebody wants to wait until after that because they prefer their question would not be recorded, we will also have a very short, uh, there will also be an opportunity to uh, ask questions after the live stream has been ended. So just let me know if uh, you'd like that. And I'll make a quick announcement at the end before that, before that occurs. Thanks, Alex. I think Z has got a question. Uh, yes, thank you, James. And thank you for the really interesting and great talk. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on um, the connection between the spherical uh, GPs in general to um, say the kind of representation of um, like objects in 3D um, space, like where we use um, older representation or quaternion. Um, so it seems to me there could be an Real con connection, but it's not entirely obvious. So I wonder if you have any thoughts. I wish I had something smart to say, but uh, I don't really have have a strong connection to make for you. So yes, yeah, I want to. I use an awful lot in computer graphics and rendering. Uh, so if you go and Google for spherical harmonic packages, you will find lots of work in in that area. And yeah, some of the spherical harmonics are very strongly related to the behavior of some simple atoms as well. Um, so there is definitely a connection, there's a connection there, but I'm not really able to say that, you know, this means that neural networks are doing quantum computing uh, or any such, uh, such lovely claim that I'd like to be able to make. Um, it's certainly true that, you know, these Rayleigh functions give rise to these spherical functions. And, uh, you know, there's definitely an awareness in the deep learning community that uh, analyzing the eigenstructure of these deep neural networks tells us very much how well they would generalize. So there's some lovely, there is some lovely work on, you know, looking at what the eigen, uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions is of, uh, of neural networks and then being able to predict how well that neural network will generalize. But uh, I don't have, I don't have a strong connection for you for how how those things are related, but I would certainly love to read your paper on that if you'd like to write one. Thank you. Giacomo. Yes, hi, I have a question about how does it compare the, let's say, training cost with this technique compared to a normal neural network training? Because from what you said, it, it would appear something very efficient, but if you didn't say that it's increasingly efficient, maybe it's still slower. And I like to understand why. Uh, 
Uh, that's a really good question, Jack. Well, so there are a few things that affect the efficiency of, of training. Right? So uh, the way that I have been training these, these gouting processes is to write down the elbow and then back propagate using my favorite deep learning packages uh, to optimize and pass in the gradients and add them and so on. But the, some of the things that affect the computational performance are how much does the prior cost to decompose? And in this case, the, the prior is linear scaling to decompose. So there's we don't have to do any Cholesky of the kernel matrix or similar, which is usually cubic scaling. We've got this lovely uh, diagonal matrix, which makes all those, all those things work well. But there are some choices that you can make that might affect the scaling. Um, so uh, if I go back here to have a quick look at this elbow, then there is this S matrix in here. With S is a, is a positive definite matrix that you have to optimize over. And so if you use a large number of functions to approximate your, your posterior, a large number of inducing functions or inducing points, S will be big and you have to optimize over it and that might be slow. So you might choose to make some structure in S to make that to go faster, but then your approximation might not be quite so accurate. Um, I can say that training these things is kind of a joy compared with training a neural network. So you know, maximizing the elbow is a really lovely paradigm to work with because you know that improving the elbow makes the KL smaller. And so uh, you, you know, you've got closer to the real objective and there's no worrying about overfitting or training validation loss or, or similar. Um, you know, making the elbow better is just, is just better. So that's, uh, although it might be computationally not quite the same per pass of the data as a neural network, the amount of fiddling and tuning that you might have to do is, is significantly, significantly easier. All right, I think that's uh, about time, but Bobby has a question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you, uh, you showed how, um, how this approach leads to some sort of uh, results that are more robust to corruption. I was wondering if you could elaborate a, a little more on, on how that how that arises. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. So I guess uh, in the Gaussian process community, we have been wondering for a long time um, what the right way to extrapolate is. And so if you look at a very classic introduction to Gaussian processes plot, you'll see some prior over functions. And then uh, as you move away from the data, the prior will go, the, 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 the distribution will go back to the prior. And so the Gaussian process kind of extrapolates in this very conservative, uh, conservative fashion that says, if I don't have any data here, then I'm not going to guess. I'm just going to tell you that we've got the prior back. And that kind of behavior is what drives I'm speculating a little bit here, but that's what drives things like Bayesian optimization. So using that kind of, uh, sort of conservative nature of the model means that you can query the model of places you haven't seen before, and it'll say, I don't know. And you can use that to set up an explore exploit trade-off. And what's what's happening, or the, the classic view of what's happening in the you know, process of some of these figures is, you know, when we rotate the MNIST or corrupt the MNIST or C file or whatever, we're putting a new input into the Gaussian process and it's not seen this input before. And so we're asking it to extrapolate. And when a Gaussian process gets asked to extrapolate, it says, I've not seen this input before. I'm going to increase my predictive variance. And so it says, you know, this is my best guess, but you're asking me to extrapolate here. So I'm not as confident. And that's why we see these sort of um, improved test load likelihoods because we're instead of extrapolating into a part of the neural network space that's full of random weights because it hasn't been trained because there have been no, no inputs there now when we've got a Gaussian process paradigm we're extrapolating into a place where there are no data and so the gp extrapolates using this very kind of conservative mechanism i hope that answers your question all right um so 
I would like to um, just uh, start to uh, conclude uh, today's talk by thanking everybody for joining us, in particular, uh, all our listeners also on YouTube, and remind that we have another seminar coming up next week. Uh, you can check out our schedule on our website, which is uh, gp-seminar-series.github.io, and uh, feel free to uh, join us next week. Um, I think myself and a few others may stick around briefly for discussion, and um, you can continue to kind of ask questions. I don't know if James can stick around or not, but if you are, uh, some of us at least will be here. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us.